Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is one where we do have a resolution to the case, but we never truly found out why it happened. It was such a brutal situation and we're just being left with so many questions even though this case is technically solved. With that being said, let's just jump right into the case. Danielle Marjeka was 18 years old when she died and she was living in Clinton Township, Michigan with her father Robert and her brother Kevin and she had another brother named Robert Jr. Unfortunately, Danielle's mother had passed away back in 2011 from an overdose. Danielle attended Lakeshore High School and she was described as having many friends and being popular in school. She was also described as being a beautiful soul who managed to find positivity in everything. She was someone who could be content with doing her own thing and she didn't rely on others to make her happy. She was just an independent person, happy to do her own thing. At the time, Danielle was dating 19-year-old Seren Bryan. Seren was described as being very introverted, he was quiet and artistic, and even though he didn't talk too much, he was known as being a happy person overall. He liked to write and draw in his journals, and he too was content just doing his own thing. Robert Sr., Danielle's father, worked as a general contractor doing paint work. Robert Jr. would work with his father most of the time, and Kevin would work with them occasionally when he needed the money. Either way, the contractor gave them three white vans for work purposes, but Robert Jr. was known to use this van for personal purposes as well. Now, at the time that this all happened, Seren had been living with Danielle as well as her father, Robert, and her brothers, Kevin and Robert Jr. in a mobile home that Robert Jr. was renting out. Just to go over the makeup of the house, Danielle and Seren lived in a room together, Kevin and his girlfriend had another bedroom temporarily, and Robert Jr. had his own bedroom. Then Robert, Danielle's father, he slept on the living room couch until Kevin and his girlfriend moved out just like a week or two before Danielle's death. The family was known to move around very frequently from place to place. They would often get evicted because they did have trouble paying their rent. Now, back in August of 2018, Danielle and Saren both started working the night shift at National Coney Island with one of Danielle's friends, Crescinda. But because neither Danielle or Saren had a car, Crescinda would drive them to and from work. On the night of August 22nd, 2018, the three went to work at around 9 p.m. and Crescinda dropped them back off at the house at 8 a.m. on August 23rd. That morning at 8.15 a.m., Robert Sr. left for work, saying goodbye to Danielle as she left and was settling in after her shift. However, the same evening on August 23rd, Danielle and Saren were scheduled for another shift at work. At around 1 p.m. that day, Crescinda sent Danielle a message on Facebook Messenger to let her know that she wasn't going to be able to drive them to work that evening because she was having car troubles. Then at 5 p.m. that evening, Crescinda sent Danielle another message saying that she actually found them a ride to work after all, but Danielle hadn't responded to either of these messages. By 7 p.m., just an hour before her shift, Crescinda sent Danielle a third message to say that the ride had actually fallen through. Once again, Danielle did not respond to these messages. Not only that, but the messages weren't being delivered properly. They weren't being delivered, which told Crescinda that Danielle's phone had been turned off or it was dead. This concerned her because she knew that Danielle literally always had her phone on her and she literally always carried a phone charger. There was never a reason for the phone to be turned off or dead. Then both Danielle and Saren failed to show up for work that day as well. This was very out of character for Danielle and Saren because they were very responsible, timely employees who showed up on time and would never just no call, no show. If they weren't going to be at work, they would always call work to let them know. So by 5 p.m. on the evening of August 24th, now going into the next day when Crescinda still hadn't heard from Danielle, she went to the home where Danielle and Saren lived to check in on them. When she got there, Robert Sr. and Robert Jr. were both home. 
At the time, Robert Sr. was intoxicated, so he refused to let Crescinda into the home at first, but she said she didn't want any issues, she just wanted to see Danielle. So after a few minutes, Robert Sr. let Crescinda into the home. So she sat down in the living room with Robert and spoke to him about Danielle. Robert Jr. was also there and he seemed perfectly normal and relaxed, but he didn't participate in the conversation. He sort of just sat there and listened to them have a conversation. So Crescinda decided to take a look in Danielle's bedroom and she noticed immediately that the room seemed a lot messier and disorganized than she had always kept it. There was a blanket and a top sheet thrown on the bed with no like normal sheets on it. Those were not where they normally would have been, and the fact that there was no sheet was also a little bit concerning. Danielle's phone charger wasn't by her bed like it normally was, and the pillows were actually missing from her bed. While looking around, Crescinda started calling around to different friends of Danielle's to see if anybody had seen or heard from her, but nobody had. Crescinda stayed at the home for another three hours just trying to get a hold of anybody who knew where Danielle was but she had no luck. During this time, Robert Jr. had left the home without really saying much that entire time. So finally, by 8 p.m. that day, Crescinda left and went to work. But this nagging feeling and worry didn't subside while she was at work. She returned back to the home by 5 a.m. on August 25th after her work shift. She walked inside and woke up Robert Sr., who was still drunk at that time, by that point, Crescinda was having none of it. She started arguing with Robert Sr., telling him that he needed to report Danielle as missing. But Robert disagreed. He told Crescinda that he had warrants out for his arrest and that police would come in and investigate the house they lived in, so he asked that Crescinda report them as missing and tell police that they actually lived with her so that police wouldn't be sniffing around in his business. So she did report Danielle as missing, but apparently police would not let her report Saren as missing because she wasn't related to him. I don't know exactly how that worked. I don't know if she said that, you know, Danielle was her roommate. So that's why she was able to report her missing and not Saren. I'm not exactly sure. Now, later that same day, another friend of Danielle's, Allison, also went to the house to look for her. She also looked around Danielle's bedroom and she found that Danielle's bag, her laptop, her purse, and her glucose monitor all had been left behind. This was concerning because Danielle had type 1 diabetes, so she needed that glucose monitor to keep track of when she needed her insulin, so there's no way that she would have just willingly left without it. They also did find some spots of blood on Danielle's mattress, but none of her friends thought anything of it because she did unfortunately suffer from a miscarriage a few months earlier, which resulted in her bleeding, so they all thought that this was just from that. So Crescendo went ahead and took all of these items to the police for them to investigate. By the following day on August 26th, Kevin, Danielle's brother, and his girlfriend Erin came over to the house to talk to Crescinda and the other friends about what was going on. As a reminder, Kevin and Erin had lived in the home previously, but they literally had just moved out a week or two prior. Either way, they did come over to look around as well, and they actually didn't think that there was any sort of struggle or anything else that looked out of place in Danielle's room, even though Crescinda said that it did look messier than normal. Kevin didn't really think that was an issue, but he did say that something did feel off. So, he went outside to check the grass outside of her window to see if there was maybe an intruder or something like that, but once outside, he noticed a very foul odor, and after looking around, he saw that there was a very unusually large amount of flies surrounding the shed that was located in the back behind the house. When Kevin went back inside the home to get the key to the shed, he noticed that the key was gone. But thankfully, they actually had a spare key at their home, so they went and got that spare key and unlocked the shed. When opening the shed, Kevin saw that there was a box spring and a lawnmower which blocked them from seeing anything behind it. So they moved these items and they saw that there were two large plastic bags in the back of the shed. So Kevin used a box cutter to open one of the bags and inside the bag, they found a leg sticking out 
Everybody immediately left the shed and called 911 to report this. When police arrived, they took the bags and sent them to the medical examiner's office to further investigate. Happy birthday to you. Friends are trying to cope with what may have happened to their good friends Danielle Marjeska and Seren Bryan, seen in this birthday video. I was just in shock for, I don't know if I've ever been in shock, but I was in shock. She would love animals, she would love bugs, she would never kill an animal, she'd never harm anything. The two lived with Danielle's father and brother in the Rudgate Clinton Mobile Home Park on Culver Drive. Concerned friends had filed a missing persons report after they didn't hear from Danielle in a couple of days. We were all just kind of waiting for her to message and say, like, you guys are, you know, so dramatic, like, I'm fine, you know, but it never happened. Friends and family were searching the property yesterday when they found something horrifying. Our mutual friend, Crescinda, and Danielle's older brother, Kevin, and his girlfriend, Erin, uh, had found a body in the shed and that they didn't know who it was but they found a body. After police investigated Sunday night, they found another body in the shed. They confirmed one body was an 18-year-old woman. Yeah, we believe it's Danielle and Seren. Friends don't understand who would do this, but they say they've left a gaping hole that can't be replaced. She was several people. She was several characters wrapped up into one person. Uh, and it's just never going to be anybody else like her. Of course, they found out that inside of each plastic garbage bag was the body of 18-year-old Danielle and 19-year-old Saren. When examining Saren, they found that he was wrapped in five plastic bags. He had three bags around his head and neck and one bag over his lower body, and the other bag was around his upper body, and then there was black duct tape on his mouth and the sides of his face as well as on the back of his neck. It's believed that at one point the tape was over his nose and mouth, but some of it had moved due to the bodies decomposing and maybe them moving around while the bodies were being transported. Saren had three scalp lacerations to the back of his head from blunt force trauma. According to the medical examiner, it appeared that the three blows to his head occurred while Saren was alive but this would have rendered him unconscious. However, this was not his cause of death. When he was found, he had his knees tucked all the way into his chest and his arms were over his knees within those bags. His wrists and ankles were bound separately and then together with duct tape. His cause of death actually ended up being asphyxia due to suffocation. Danielle was found in three plastic bags. One was around her entire body, and then the other two were around her head and neck. She was also found to have duct tape around her nose and mouth, as well as on her neck. Again, it's thought that the tape on her neck just moved around due to decomposition and when he was moving the bodies. She also had several lacerations from blunt force trauma, as well as several skull fractures that were pretty much all over her skull. Due to the severity of the skull fractures that she had suffered, the medical examiner couldn't for sure determine whether she died from asphyxia or if she had died from the blunt force trauma to her head. She was also found with her knees tucked up into her chest. She wasn't found with her wrists or ankles bound, but there was a loop of duct tape by her ankles in that bag, which suggested that she probably was bound at some point before her body began to decay. So again, based on this, we can see that Saren was hit in the head, but Danielle suffered a lot worse of injuries, so whoever did this to them really took it out on Danielle a lot more. Neither of them had signs of strangulation or defensive wounds, and there were no signs that somebody attempted to save them with CPR. So again, they were attacked, hit over the head, and murdered after that. When police went to Danielle and Saren's room to investigate the scene, they found that there was blood spatter under a doily or a little decorative mat that was on the TV stand. They also found blood under a makeup kit where she kept her makeup, and then using luminol, police found that there looked to have been blood on the wall and the floor that had been cleaned up. Then within Danielle's walk-in closet, there was a water heater. 
Behind that water heater, police found a roll of black duct taped behind it. Upon investigating that roll of duct tape, they found a fingerprint as well as some small amounts of blood spatter. Also within that closet, police found a pair of pants which had paint on them, a shirt, a bunch of towels, and an Xfinity box, which all of them had blood on. An Xfinity box, for those of you who don't know, is basically like a cable box for a TV. Then police went ahead into the shed to investigate there. In the shed, police found another plastic bag which contained several items of interest. In that bag, they found pillows, a makeup kit, needles that Danielle used for checking her blood glucose levels, a 27 ounce rubber hammer, an empty roll of duct tape, another roll of black duct tape, as well as a fitted sheet which matched the sheet that would have been on Danielle and Saren's bed. Of course, police ran the blood and the fingerprints through their systems to see if they could get a match to anybody. On that rubber hammer, they found that Danielle and Saren's DNA was present on the head of the hammer, and they found that Danielle and her brother Robert's DNA was located on the handle of the hammer. So clearly, someone had used this hammer to hit Danielle and Saren over their heads. Then on the bloody clothing that they found, police found DNA that matched Robert Jr., Kevin, and Danielle. Then on that empty roll of duct tape, they found DNA that belonged to Saren, Danielle, and Robert Jr. Then they found that fingerprint on that duct tape that was also a match to Robert Jr. From here on out, I am going to be calling Robert Jr. just by Robert, so don't get confused. When I say Robert, I mean Danielle's brother. He's who we are going to be talking about pretty much all throughout the rest of the video, so I'm just going to call him Robert. So, by that point, police were pretty set in what they believe could have happened and who was responsible. They knew that Robert was one of the only people with access to that shed, and he was the only person in the family that wasn't present when police arrived. He was the only one who wasn't interested in helping with the investigation or looking for his sister and her boyfriend. So, police set out to find where Robert was because he wasn't at home and nobody knew where he went off to. Police started by tracking Robert's cell phone to see where he was on the night that Danielle was last seen and where he could have gone after. So, on August 23rd, as I stated before, this is when her friends noticed that she hadn't been responding. At 10.13 a.m. on that day, phone records show that Robert was at home. Then, by 1.22 p.m., he called a cab which picked him up and took him to a Wendy's restaurant located about two miles away from the home. He arrived inside of the restaurant at 1.42 p.m. Then at 1.35 p.m., probably while still in the cab, phone records show that Robert called Williams Carpet Care, so a carpet cleaning company. So that's most likely how he was able to clean the carpet in the room, why it was probably pretty good other than like little specks that police were able to find. After that, Robert hopped on a bus getting off near a Tim Hortons. He stayed there for a while before his father, Robert Sr., picked him up in his work van at 5.30 p.m. Robert then stayed in the area of their home within Clinton Township for the following three days. As we know, Crescinda saw him at the home when she initially went to look for Danielle on August 24th, but he left after that. By the 26th of August, Robert paid in cash for a room at the Riverfront Inn. While there, he made a call at 10.25 p.m. I believe it was early into the next morning that Robert left the inn, leaving behind his computer and his cell phone. The next day, on August 27th at 2 a.m., police officers reported seeing Robert's work van at a Circle K in Toledo, Ohio, an hour and a half away from Clinton Township. According to a witness, Robert went inside to buy a fountain soda, he also attempted to buy cigarettes, but he dug around in his pockets for a good few minutes and he wasn't able to find his ID, so he wasn't able to buy the cigarettes. At that point, police responded to the area, but he was no longer there. They took his van and impounded it, but Robert was nowhere to be found. It was also around this time that Robert was spotted at a store buying a cell phone, but again, 
he was not yet apprehended. Now, fearing that Robert would start using the transit systems to escape, police provided Greyhound employees with pictures of Robert so that if they saw him, they could report him. It turned out that late in the night on August 28th, Robert had taken a Greyhound bus from Toledo to Cincinnati, arriving at 3.45 a.m. on August 29th. After purchasing the ticket for that bus, employees recognized Robert and had notified the police. Once in Cincinnati, Robert had asked a Greyhound employee if he could use a computer, and they directed him to a local library. So, by the time police arrived to the Greyhound station, again, Robert was not there. But they found out that he was at the library, so they immediately headed over there, and by the time they got there... Robert was still there on a computer playing a computer game. When they found Robert, he was wearing a blonde wig, a hat, and sunglasses, and he was telling people that his name was Joshua Bianco. People who had seen Robert with this disguise said that it was obvious that he was trying to blend in and disguise his appearance, but everybody who saw him said that the disguise was just awful and it kind of made him stand out even more because of how bad the wig was, so that kind of backfired. But finally, on August 31st, Robert was back in Clinton Township. Police say Marjeska fled Michigan after the killings. U.S. Marshals say a break in the case came when a business in Ohio called police about his abandoned van. Good old-fashioned police work. Our guys here in Detroit and the guys here in uh, Toledo just did a local canvas with everybody handing out flyers. Next thing they knew, another business called saying they saw him. This guy came in here looking suspicious. He was wearing, uh, looked like to be a wig, sunglasses. Uh, we, we went and grabbed the surveillance video. Um, local police we were working with gave flyers to, grabbed the video. And sure enough, I mean, right when we saw that, we're like, this has to be him. Then a tip came in that he may have taken a Greyhound bus to Cincinnati. Surveillance video showed him at a Greyhound station in that same easy to spot wig speaking to a teller. They interviewed that teller and they said he was asking about a library and said he really needed to use the phone. Found him sitting in the Cincinnati Public Library uh, utilizing their Wi-Fi. The disguise was horrible. He has, I mean, it sticks out right when we seen it. We knew we're like, that's him. So, of course, police sat him down and started questioning him. There, Robert asked police what his charges were, and they said premeditated first-degree murder. He asked police what that meant, and they explained that it meant that he planned out the murder before he committed it. Robert said that he needed a minute and asked if he could call his brother, Kevin, which police did allow him to do. On that call, Kevin asked Robert if he was going to plead guilty and admit to what he did, and Robert said no, he wasn't going to do that. He ended up pleading not guilty on charges of first-degree murder, and he went to trial. The trial for two counts of first-degree premeditated murder started in November of 2019, and the prosecution argued that Robert had killed his sister and her boyfriend within their bedroom of the home that they all shared. They argued that Robert hit them both over the head with the rubber hammer before taping their mouths and noses shut, which led them to suffocating. Then he shoved their bodies in those trash bags, moved them to the shed, and cleaned up the room. However, the defense was not denying that he was the one who killed Danielle and Saren. They were arguing that it was voluntary manslaughter or second-degree murder, saying that the attacks were committed in a spontaneous act of violence. They asked that rather than being given a life sentence without the possibility of parole for first-degree premeditated murder, they asked for a verdict of voluntary manslaughter, which gives a sentence of up to 15 years, or second-degree murder, which does grant parole. The defense argued that Robert committed this crime because he was mentally ill. The courts told that in November of 2011, after his mother died of an overdose, Robert was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and paranoid delusions. They said that Robert had been hospitalized many times due to erratic behavior. They said that over the course of nine years, he had been hospitalized for a total of three to four weeks. Robert said that he had heard voices and had hallucinations. 
but he apparently didn't agree with the diagnoses when he was first given them, so he would not take his medication. The defense argued that this medication that he was prescribed was supposed to help with managing manic episodes and decrease the frequency of hallucinations. They said that because he wasn't taking his medication, it makes sense that he may have been having hallucinations and was hearing voices at the time of the murders. The defense said that he snapped in a period of a psychotic break and he was hearing voices at the time of the murders. They argued that due to mental illness, he wouldn't have the capacity to plan a murder, therefore he could not be found guilty of first degree murder. But the prosecution brought forward experts who determined that Robert was mentally capable of planning a murder. They said that there's no evidence that he was in a state of mania when committing the murders and that he did know the difference between right and wrong and he did know what he was doing when he was murdering his sister and her boyfriend. However, through all of this, we still don't know a motive for the killings. The prosecution wasn't able to find really anything that could point towards a concrete motive for killing his sister and her boyfriend. And to this day, we still don't really know a motive. But after hearing all of the evidence that clearly showed that Robert was responsible and that he committed the murders and at least knew enough to flee, and after hearing from experts that he did have the capacity to plan, on November 22nd, 2019, the jury found Robert guilty of the first degree murder of Danielle and Saren. And by July 14th of 2020, he was sentenced to a mandatory life sentence without the possibility of parole for both murders. Yes, good morning, Your Honor. As uh, Sarah's mom has already indicated, there's mandatory sentencing, and I have indicated that to my clients. We all know that uh, none of this is going to affect that. And I don't want to relitigate the case, but as the court will look at the file, Mr. Uh, Marzeka has had mental illness for a long time. He's heard voices, he's been hospitalized. He's actually been petitioned by his brother, who's present in the court, and by his father. Uh, what happened to uh, Siren that day in Danielle is absolutely horrific. It should not have happened. It shouldn't happen to anybody. And certainly should not have been disposed of or discovered in the manner that they were. I just want the court to keep uh, track of the fact that this was, Your Honor, not to make any excuses or to make a mockery of the judicial system, but it was, in fact, a product of mental illness, and uh, that's well substantiated. The jury just did not uh, see it that way. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Do you wish to say anything? No. You don't wish to say anything? You murdered your sister, Danielle, and her boyfriend, Sarah, and you don't wish to say anything? No. All right. Well, uh, I just want to point out in the PSI, it says, the defendant reported that he is in good physical and mental health. So... You don't have much to say, sir, so I don't have much to say except that you're an evil man and you're going where you belong. So the sentence of the court is you place the Michigan Department of Corrections for a period of life without parole with 500 for three days served. Okay, let's thank go. you, Your Honor. After this, Robert did file for an appeal. In the appeal, they argued that the defense was ineffective at proving to the jury that he had a severe mental illness. His defense didn't bring forward any experts who could speak on the symptoms of his mental illness or the effects that not taking his medication could have had. Instead, I believe Kevin was explaining Robert's mental health issues and the fact that he didn't want to take his medications and he spoke to the symptoms that he was showing and the behaviors that he had shown over the years. But in the state of Michigan, the defense of diminished capacity basically saying that the defense didn't know right from wrong, therefore can't be guilty, that is banned. And I applaud Michigan for that because that defense is the stupidest one, I think, because you still did a murder. If you murdered someone, even if you were in a state of like panic or whatever, you still did it and you still need to take responsibility for taking that person's life. But either way, 
Based on this, the panel of three judges did deny the appeal, saying, quote, evidence of mental illness is not admissible for the purpose of negating premeditation. Trial counsel cannot be ineffective for failing to call an expert witness to support a legally unavailable defense. So, as of right now, Robert is still in prison for the double murders, and again, we still don't know why. And honestly, I don't know even close to enough about the family and their background to sit here and try to come up with answers. I wish we knew more about the relationship between the members of the family, but from what little we do know, it didn't appear like this was the most functional of families. Clearly, Robert must have had some sort of mental health issues that led to what he did. Again, it doesn't excuse what he did. I am happy he's behind bars, and I do think that he planned it out, or at least at some point he grabbed that hammer, hit them, and then he took all of the steps to conceal it, and then he fled, which in my opinion, even if he didn't directly plan it, that's enough to show that he knew that he murdered them, he knew he might get caught, so he had to leave, so... I'm happy that he was charged with premeditated first-degree murder. But that is all of the information that I have for today's case, and now I want to know what you guys think. Why do you think Robert chose to kill his sister and her boyfriend? Do you think it was premeditated, or do you think it was really just him snapping and it was in the spur of the moment? Do you think that mental health has something to do with this, and do you think that he should have gotten a lesser sentence because of that? Let me know any of your thoughts in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Make sure you turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. And make sure you check out my Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. All are linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have with that, I hope you guys have an amazing week, stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!